We've all been looking for what to do, and uh, I think we have a great guest that can help us with that. Her name is uh, Lisa Fithian, and she's a longtime grassroots organizer of nonviolent direct action, and she's a nonviolent direct action trainer. She's currently on the national team of Extinction Rebellion, United States. She's participated in a range of movements and mobilizations, including Occupy Wall Street, anti-WTO, and corporate globalization protests all over the world my favorite was when she organized the janitors. That yes. was fantastic. She also has a new book out. Here it is. It's called Shut It Down. <laughs> Stories from a Fierce Loving Resistance. Please welcome to the show Lisa Fithy. And Lisa, thanks so much for being here. How are you? I'm doing great, Jimmy. So excited to be here as well. Yep. So I want to, uh, uh, I've soured uh, recently very much in a hard way on electoral politics. Uh, does that, uh, to someone like you, so right now, People are feeling in despair because our, our politicians to the person has let us down to the point or even Bernie Sanders voted for the stimulus without calling out the leadership of either party. So right now, a lot of people are saying what they're doing in this uh, in the response to a pandemic, first of all, not giving us health care. But what they are doing is transferring wealth upward, which is going to turn our country into a Brazil like uh, culture if we don't do something about it. And uh, I and I just like I said, I've soured on electoral politics uh, and I feel like I have a lot of impotent rage at this show. But what what do you say we, we should be doing in this moment? What could we be doing and what do you expect to happen? Hmm. Well, you know, Jimmy, I learned at a young age that. Our power was in the streets, not in the halls of Congress or legislatures. I mean, there's a power there and they can do a lot of harm, but that's not where our problems are going to be fundamentally addressed. And so it's more for me, it's I've learned that like if we can create the popular mandate for what we want, then the politicians are going to come and do what we need. And I've also, it's like the electoral arena. It's not a space where I like to work either, but I have learned also over the years, because some people have really called me out on it, that people gave their lives for the right to vote. And that in this current reality, that is a primary means of changing power. And so I listened, recently listened to a, a podcast by Arundhati Roy. And one of the things she said really helped me a lot when I think about electoral organizing she said, well, first of all, don't confuse democracy with voting because democracy is much bigger than voting. But in terms of election, she said, it's about voting for the enemy that you want to have. So understanding that we, we are voting for the person that we think we can organize and move the most. So just that on electoral stuff. But back to like my thinking and all of this stuff right now, it's about, it's the same thing it always is. It's about organizing. It's about helping as many people as possible, even if it's one person at a time, to sort of open up their mind, to imagine that things don't have to be this way. We don't have to accept things the way they are and that there are other ways of being in relationship to one another, where we actually can care for one another, where there can be justice. And so that's for me, that's always been my way is, is, is organizing and using direct action as one of my fundamental strategies, because I've seen it as the most radically and rapidly transforming strategy. And that's what we're seeing with all these strikes. Strikes are a primary form of direct action where we withdraw our consent and we challenge power. So uh, I'm thrilled about what's happening with workers in this country right now. So I could go on and on, but let me see if you have another question. <laughs> now, going forward, we're gonna, uh, so uh, in this time when our, again, our representative government has abandoned us, which is what has happened, and it keeps happening. Uh, you, I, I know you said uh, uh, mass marches. Like, so we had, when Trump got elected, we had the Women's March. And I went to it, I covered it. And there were 700,000 people in the streets in Los Angeles. And it accomplished absolutely nothing. It didn't have a purpose. And I like what you say, mass marches must be coupled with strategic direct actions and mass community network building if their impact is going to last. Yep. So first you say you need to create a social crisis, and, that, and then you say that about mass marches. Could you talk to both those things? Sure. Um, and I completely agree with you. I was also at that women's march, and I was like out of my mind. I was like, 
march to the Capitol, go take the Capitol. Why are we just wandering aimlessly in the streets, you know? So um, I've said that to the folks during these giant climate strikes and trying to communicate to the youth. If you're going to pull all these people out, do something with those bodies, go shut something down, take it over, occupy it. Because what happens when we take and hold space is when those social networks come into being, because we then have to like take care of one each other while we hold space. And that's a whole, like we saw it with Occupy. We took a park, right? And then we had to have food. And then we had to take care of each other sleeping. And then we had to have workshops and libraries to keep us entertained. And then we needed sanitation. So when you come together, you need those networks for basic human needs. But the other piece of that is, yes, it's that social crisis. And that's been one of the pieces I've been, as I've gone around with this book and I've been talking to more and more people, when we're taking on governments or big corporations, they're huge. They have a lot of resources. They are un, they're willing to do us harm. And so we have to, when we go up against them, use our resources well. And we have to understand that we have to create a crisis for them. It means we have to come at them in many different ways. And we have to intervene in their world. So if they care about money, we have to cost them money. If they care about doing their business, we have to disrupt their business. If they care about their image, we have to tarnish their image. And we and I've also said, you know, they don't really care about us at all, but they care about a whole set of other players that are in their world. So we don't have to just go at them. We have to go at all of the players in their world and start disrupting their reality. Because the more disruption we can create, the more they actually have to do something. And if we're targeting social disruption in cities, and this is one of the things I learned working with the janitors, is that we were going after the building owners. Um, but at the end of the day, we were making it politically impossible for that city to have peace. And so the mayors and the people in power ultimately had to come in and say to the building owners, You've got to settle this thing because we are no longer willing to have folks block our bridges and shut our streets down. So, so that's part of our problem is that so many uh, organizations, nonprofits, community-based organizations, and even labor unions are so vested in the system as it is and so afraid to seriously challenge it because they don't want to you know, put their own assets at risk. So we never actually organize to disrupt things the way we need to, to actually get the change we want. Okay. So that's part of a, an effective strategy for winning is creating disruption for those who are profiting off of our bodies. So you're an expert at direct action. And right now it's just crazy to me that in the middle of a pandemic, uh, we've lost our government. They won't give us health care. They won't give us UBI, even though they're shutting down our economy. And in the middle of all this, they're using this crisis to transfer wealth upward. People don't know what to do. We're having lots of wildcat strikes. Uh, you talk now you've been successful in doing direct action in the past. Uh, tell, tell me what is preventing people in the United States from rising up right now? I know there's a pandemic, so you can't go out without a mask, but what would be, I mean, it just seems like, like for instance, the yellow vests in, in uh, France. Now they, they had a, an appointment to meet every Saturday, right? They kept the yellow vest thing going. Uh, what is wrong with the United States? Why can't they already have the things we need to protest for? And they're still protesting in France. What is wrong with the United States? Yeah, that's like such a great question. I wish we could figure it out. I, I was actually spent the month of January in Washington, D.C., uh, doing actions every day around uh, in the impeachment process. And we were like, if only we could get thousands of people here, we might actually impeach this guy. And so I keep looking at what is preventing from people from rising up and taking power. And I think there's two things. One is a, a friend of mine, Malik Rahim, who helped form, form Common Ground in New Orleans after Katrina, said that we're drunk on prosperity, right? That if we were sober, we would not be going along with what's happening. So that also speaks to the fact that, that, we're, that this culture creates a lot of addiction to many different things that prevent us from like dealing with the reality of what's happening. I think the other piece we're really facing is fear. You know, we've watched the militarization of the police. We've watched this expansion of the security state. 
We know that, um, you know, even workers themselves who are, you know, barely surviving, you know, are at risk of being fired if they take action. So I think there's a tremendous amount of fear that people in this country are carrying. And so it's, it's you know, I, I mean, again, I don't, I don't get it when things are so terrible. Um, but I think that's what's preventing and holding people back, which is actually one reason why I wore courage today, because I think it's important to people to understand, like, there are reasons to be afraid, but we can still take action despite our fear. You know, we have to sort of figure out where we find that courage, because one thing I have learned, Jimmy, is that when we are depressed or despondent or afraid, it's when we do something about it, especially when we begin to do something that's part of a collective, we can transform that that fear and turn it, turn it really into life-giving energy. And so it's it sets us free, quite frankly. So that's why I keep doing this stuff, but we are challenged in this era on our collective action embodied. <laughs> so you're, you're working with Extinction Rebellion right now, right, correct? Correct. And so tell me, what's, what are some of the things you're working on right now? And what, what could people do to help out? Well, um, so one of the biggest things that's happening right now in terms of the climate crisis is one, looking at how rapidly nature is recovering since we have stopped living our lives based on commuting, shipping, right? Uh, you have the air cleaning up in places around the country, water cleaning up, wildlife regenerating. So it's one, helping people understand that as we're living in this new world, that we're actually able to survive in, for the most part, we're re redefining normal, but the planet is coming back. So there's one thing about, we can live differently. The second thing, you know, with the, with the, uh, the oil and gas industry coming down. Again, uh, I think that's that's one of the things people are trying to organize around right now is trying to prevent a bailout of the oil and gas industries to enable them to keep doing this and just trying to stop these pipelines. Um, the other piece that we're just trying to do is, is continuing to figure out how to get the word out to as many people as possible that, um, you know, th this pandemic that we're in, this crisis that we're in, you know, it's a similar kind of period, just like the climate crisis. And we're all struggling to figure out, you know, how we're going to survive both in a, the COVID crisis and the climate crisis. So a lot of it is public education. A lot of it is virtual actions. Another piece of the work we've, a lot of the chapters, because it's, uh, Extinction Rebellion is a very decentralized network. <clears throat> But where we've taken some collective actions, like in April, there's an initiative called Stop the Money Pipeline, and where people have been targeting banks that are investing in the fossil fuel industry. There's been a lot of other collective actions against KKR, which is the primary investor in um, the pipeline, the wet to wet pipeline in Canada. So people are doing actions around the pipelines, oil industry, and helping to educate people that this crisis is not going to go away just when COVID goes away, we've got to keep organizing. And so, so right now uh, we've seen the power of the essential worker, right? So if grocery store workers went on strike tomorrow, I feel like they could demand anything they wanted from this country and they would get it. Meaning they don't, they could, they could demand uh, higher pay because they're essential workers and they could demand hazard pay. Uh, they could also demand Medicare. They can demand health care, like, just like their grandparents have. They can demand that. They can demand whatever they, they wanted, they could demand. How do we make that happen? How do we real? I mean, right now we have to make people real. You know, it was during President Nixon when we got the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, OSHA, the EPA, and he wasn't a lefty, right? So people are the ones who got that stuff done. How do we get that done today? How do we make that? For instance, I say if the essential workers of just the grocery stores decided to stop work tomorrow, it would stop this country down and they could, could they could direct the uh, political action. What, what can we do to get that right now? Right. Well, there's um, one is to get the traditional labor unions to be bolder and braver. I mean, one of the problems is that in many unionized workplaces, there are restrictions in the contract for strikes until that contract is expiring. So you're seeing a lot of strikes and walkouts in, in non 
organized work sites, right? Correct. Because there's no no rules there, basically. So there, there's other creative ways that the unionized workplaces can do. But you're absolutely right that they, the you know, it's, a, it's an organizing process. I hate saying that, but it's about helping people understand that they have power, that they can take action that can make a difference. So a friend of mine, a man named Stephen Lerner, has recently written an article in the American Prospect. It's about what we should not be doing. And I worked with him on the Justice for Janitors campaign. And some of the lessons from that campaign that he's continuing to carry forward <clears throat> in terms of this moment is that we can no longer just be organizing site by site, which is traditionally how unions have organized. We have to organize sort of company-wide and industry-wide. Another new innovation is that we don't want to move bargaining just on wages and benefits, but recognizing that we can bargain for what they're calling the common good. And you've seen that again when the teachers went on strike and they included housing for their students as part of their negotiations. Or the janitors went on strike in Minneapolis and they fought and won on beginning to get climate you know, issues addressed in their contract, environmental issues. So we need to be bolder in our bargaining. And then the other piece is to recognize, and we did this with the janitors as well, is to begin to organize your contract expirations <clears throat> to come up in the same year. So you can leverage your power. And I believe, and Stephen writes about this in the article, I don't know the numbers, but there's like thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of workers whose contracts are going to be expiring over the next year or two. And so how do we start working across geographies, across the work sites, to maximize the worker power that we have for more significant shutdowns. Because again, you know, a strike is a shutdown. It's trying to like stop business as usual, withdraw our labor, withdraw our consent, and force the companies into crisis. And so how do you said, you know, make big labor unions become more bold? I don't see them being more bold. How do we, how does that happen? You know what I mean? Like, so... <laughs> Uh, right. So let me just, I'll just leave it there and we'll go ahead. Well, how does that, how do we make big labor unions more bold? Well, that's a one, another one of those like big questions. And, you know, I think it's similar to what I said earlier on about politicians. It's like when you create the popular mandate in the streets, the politicians have no choice. When you have hundreds, if not thousands of workers walking out on wildcat strikes and demonstrating the power of that, the unions are going to follow. Even the teachers unions, like we've seen these massive successful strikes, like the union leadership was not backing the teachers, but they did it anyway. Right. And then the leadership has to follow. Right. And so again, as, as these wildcat strikes and non-unionized workers are taking more and more action into this walking out, it's going to create some momentum and energy. And then those traditional labor union people are going to be like, oh, there's some juice there. There's some power there. Let's get involved in this. <clears throat> and then the unions that are, are are actually braver and more innovative, but who's what's well, also interesting. I don't know a lot about this, but I want to find out more. I was reading how there were actually Democratic legislators in like uh, Denver or, or it was actually Las Vegas who were advocating for uh, rolling back collective bargaining rights for the public sector workers, which was crazy. And then I was like, all of a sudden, I was like, well, maybe that's not such a bad thing because if those collective bargaining rights go away. Then the workers can strike wholesale. They have nothing holding them back. But the craziness is they're going to be striking to win back what they're taking away. So it's like we are living in insane time. So, so I think it requires well, well, just like maybe what it really takes is that workers in unionized shops starting to take more action on what those essential fights are right now around workplace protections and pressurizing their own leadership to take action. You know, it always comes from the bottom up. That's the power of workers. So a Amazon, Instacart, and Whole Foods workers, and some a few others went on a limited wildcat strike. Uh, now, I, they don't have a union at Amazon or Whole Foods or Instacart workers. Right. Um, why is that? Why can't we organize those workers? What is the problem? Well, I think... I just a big effort to organize Walmart workers. And mm -hmm. what we saw during both the Walmart fight and the Amazon fight is that the workers eventually peeled off and formed their own association. So uh, it became our Walmart, and now it's something else. Uh, Athena, I think it's called. And the Amazon workers, they have formed the Amazonians United. 
And what's happening is that that's now spreading to other workers, Amazon workers and other work sites. So the organizing is happening. <clears throat> it's being supported by, you know, different, you know, I don't know what, there are union organizers involved in trying to support these fights, but it's fundamentally being led by the workers themselves. And so, um, you know, and that's actually what a union's all about, you know? Yeah. And at some point- so we- we we covered the uh, in like in for instance in Portland the Voodoo uh, Donut uh, workers have organized and it's through the International Workers IWW I think it is and okay. so they're they're not even going through the national the uh, the normal process of going through the National Labor Relations Board having uh, 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 elections of their union they're just banding together striking and making demands immediately and they're getting them. So right. that there's a name for that, I think, solidarity strikes or something. Now I'm, now I'm forgetting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Solidarity strikes, wildcat strikes, you name mm-hmm. it. I mean, the question with, with work site organizing or with union organizing or work organizing is like, it's one thing to make a demand and get it. But as once you get it, it can be taken away right. unless you've actually bargained a legally binding contract or agreement. Right. And then you have the additional level of protection. So again, to unionize in this country, you either have to go through the National Labor Relations Board and do an election, or you can go through a process called card check, which is what the janitor strategy was rooted in. Because the election process, you might win the election, but it doesn't guarantee you a contract. And there's many work sites that have won elections that still don't have contracts. So at the end of the day, you're organizing, whether you're in a union or a worker association, it's about exercising your power and and demonstrating to the employer that you can disrupt their business and that ultimately you're going to have to win their respect or their, that they have to do it because they have no choice because you've done such effective organizing. So I, I so, want to, I want to share this story with you. This is from a week ago from, this is from a great uh, public case payday report. Prison labor well. replaces striking garbage workers in New Orleans. Yes. Uh, on Wednesday, dozens of garbage workers employed by the temporary service People Ready went on strike, demanding proper safety equipment. The workers, who made only ten twenty-five an hour, are also demanding hazard pay and paid sick leave. Known as hoppers, the workers are dangerously exposed to immense health risks due to the consistent handling of trash and waste and are not given proper protective equipment. The private waste management company that employed the sanitation workers' Metro Disposal responded to the demands by firing several of the striking workers, and now the company is using prison laborers as strike breakers. Gregory Woods, one of the sanitation workers who staged the protests outside the Metro Disposal offices, told local reporters that grievances had been intensifying for a long time, but that the coronavirus pandemic and the poor response by the company was the final straw. And some of the striking workers who were hired through a temp agency contracted by Metro Services Group called People Ready formed the City Waste Union. But the company has refused to negotiate with the organization. Instead, the company ordered the striking workers to vacate the premises. Metro Services Group has hired several prison inmates from nearby Livingston Parish to replace striking workers. According to Louisiana labor laws, prisoners convicted of nonviolent crime can be hired as sanitation workers at only 13 percent of the usual hourly wage of 1025, essentially slave wages. Metro issued a hypocritical statement saying Metro Services Group has long been an advocate of helping persons who have been incarcerated return to society in a meaningful and productive way. Metro makes no apologies for this policy as the core element of our commitment. So they're trying to pretend they're helping uh, prisoners transition back into working life. And what they're really doing is using slave labor to break this strike. The private company that supplies prison labor, Lock 5 LLC, keeps up to 64 percent of the already substandard wages paid to inmates, uh, according to a spokesperson. This is arranged through the state and the wage garnishing it uses to cover Lock 5 expenses. Uh, So there you go. So they're literally using slave labor to break a strike in New Orleans. And how do you fight back against something like that? Right. I, yeah, that's the thing. And it literally is slave labor because slavery was never ended in this country. It was just moved from the pre- uh, plantations to the penitentiaries. And so, well, I mean, a couple of different things come to my mind. One is like, this is a place where solidarity 
between workers and community and people of faith um, and other workers is going to be essential. Um, so that's one thing is like, what's the organizing beyond this? Because this is an outrageous story. I saw a little bit about it myself. And it's like, and I do think it's winnable because I think that they can make that company because part of what you have to do in organizing is you have to like show how terrible this company is and what they're doing to break the strike and, you know, advance slave labor is crazy. So I think there's going to have to be a piece of what can we do with the trash? How do we bring that trash, literally that rotting trash to that company? How do we make it difficult for them to, uh, uh, you, you know, and again, this is so hard in this time of pandemic, but um, I think there's going to have to be some some actions going after that company, but also going after the city itself. Because again, you have to take this fight bigger than the company and you have to take, this is a fight that you could take national because there's so many people that will get so outraged about this. And so maybe there's going to be some campaign to sort of shut this company down, occupy their phones, jam their emails, <clears throat> do visibility campaigns, do coordinated days of actions, right? Because we can't let things like this happen because if this happens without a consequence, then more and more companies might try and do it. We might set up a fund to raise money to, to, to support these striking workers, right? And that's actually one of the things that we've talked about. I was involved in the people strike that, you know, put out that call to action on May Day that was then joined by organizations and networks across the company con country that are actually calling for strikes the first of the month to support the rent strikes. But we talked about how do we set up a massive strike fund to support these workers, you know, because when you go out on wildcat strike, you don't have protections. Right. You know, there's economic strikes and there's unfair labor practice strikes. And so that's a whole nother piece of a strategy of organizing is setting up for unfair labor practices that you can, the NLRB, it's a bureaucratic process, but it provides some protection for the workers because you can't be permanently replaced with an unfair labor practice strike. So I don't know. I'm, you know, sometimes I'm just like, you don't know exactly, but you throw everything you can at them. So I'd want to do a little research on this company, find out where the owners live, find out how, what other contracts or clients they have, start reaching out to them, you know, so start. Yeah. Anyway. So <clears throat> there's a whole, actually people could get my book where I talk about how to organize against these companies. Um, and I think that we are in a moment where there are people across this country that are, you know, really uh, inspired to support working people. And I think the potential for solidarity is at a level we haven't seen it before. So I wouldn't be surprised if a lot more stuff doesn't come out to support these uh, sanitation workers. And what do you think about the idea of like, you know, you, you spoke about wrench, uh, every, th that coordinated May Day strike. And we had Chris Smalls on the show. He talked about that. Uh, and we and I brought up early, but that was with Amazon and Whole Food workers, Instacart workers, and a bunch of others, and right. and so that's what I'm talking about: organizing things like that and 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 getting. Now the next step would is also like a rent strike, mortgage strike. Is that possible to to uh, organize on on a greater than local basis? Well, it's happening, and you know, again, I have not been directly involved in that, but part of it is beginning to look at. You know, are there players like who are the owners? So there's got to be some and I'm sure people are doing it. like who are the owners? You know, is it individual owners or is it like corporations or the giant funds um, and beginning to do some targeting around that? I mean, I think part of what we're seeing right now, you talked earlier about essential workers. And we're also one of the things about this moment is beginning to look at like what is really essential and we are seeing that food is essential and housing is essential and healthcare is essential and education is essential. And I think that we are on a rising tide of recognizing that we have to restructure the economy to meet those basic needs. Because we live in a country where we have political rights, but we have no really like human needs rights. <clears throat> and that's what people are seeing. And that rent strike is bringing this issue to the forefront. I mean, even it's like, like you can even see with homeless, and that's the other thing that's essential, that's, I want to say, that's critical to understand. Things that we have fought for for years or imagined that could never happen are all of a sudden happening, right? For example, we've had this homeless crisis, but all of a sudden the cities across the country are finding that they can put homeless people in all these uh, hotels, 
right? This is happening in my community in Austin, right? We've been fighting for sick days. All of a sudden, we're getting sick pay, right? So things, debt, we've been fighting against debt, global debt. The World Bank is, is, uh, is dropping the debt, student debt. So we're seeing things that we have fought for where there was just no political will happening. And so on the issue of rent strikes and mortgage, dropping mortgages, you know, we have to imagine it's possible, keep the pressure on, do some more strategic targeting. And, you know, and part of it in all this stuff is like, if you can have one success, if you can crack through someplace and get debt relief or rent relief, then that opens up the space for more and more to come. So what do you know? Do you know anything about the Hong Kong protests? Now, I understand that the organization of those protests are mind blowing and that they could in minute within minutes somehow got three million people into the streets. Do you know anything about that and how do they pull that off? I mean, I actually was tracking it a good bit, uh, not recently, but it was. Um, so, I mean, part of it is understanding the history there that when uh, when. Um, when was it? Oh man, I'm just brain dead right now. But when Hong Kong was returned to China, right? When England left right. and returned it to China, you know, there was this, you had now had a situation where you had one people or one country, but two radically different lived experiences. And from like the 2000s forwards, China has been making moves to sort of take back some of the sovereignty that it originally committed to the people of Hong Kong. And first it was this natural education plan. And then it was like a whole thing around elections. There could be elections, but in fact, China chose who the candidates would be. And then it became this whole issue around the extradition. So over several years, <clears throat> you had uprisings. And again, like most uprisings, it started with the youth on that education plan, national education program where they started to organize, took some bold action, inspired more and more people. And then you had the 2014 umbrella revolution, right? And that inspired and brought more people out. And then, so then the more, more recent revolution or uprising. And some of the things that happened there is that there was, well, one, use of technology, two, an understanding, and just some just brilliant stuff. I mean, the umbrella. Who could imagine like the power of an umbrella? And that's, again, part of the things we need to understand is that there are certain elements that go into uprising <clears throat> or these mass things like the yellow vest in France. You find an iconic image or symbol that is easily replicable, right, that everybody can identify with. Like in, in, uh, in uh, Serbia, when a movement called Atpur rose up and overthrew Milosevic, they had a, a fist in a white, a white fist in a circle, and they put that image everywhere. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's one of the things that we have to understand is that these images that we can get out into the pop population, like permeate the collective consciousness. I've been thinking about Amazon workers. Whenever I'm doing union organizing, I'm like, what are the tools of your trade? How do you bring them into your protest? So for janitors, we took trash bags and blocked doorways with trash bags or brooms and buckets. I was thinking for Amazon workers, it's the boxes. You know, they could take boxes and write messages on them and put them along the roads or outside and block doorways with them because it's like their tool. They can block stuff and it's a safe tactic to use in this time of COVID. So how do you find things? And those umbrellas in Hong Kong not only protected from the sun, but they protected against surveillance cameras. They protected against the, the sprays of the pepper spray. So they were multi-purpose. Anyway, they also, it was, again, they, they developed some online technology, which, again, I want to learn more about. <clears throat> but they made a decision not to just take space and hold it because they knew they were under attack, but take space, hold it, and then move to other spaces. And they had some online decision-making tools where they could quickly put out, we could go here, here, and here. People could vote. The one that got the most votes, they'd like, we're going there next. Went after the technology. Everybody went there. They created a space called the Lenin Wall. Again, another powerful thing that we could be doing now under COVID, setting up places and it's like an info board where information can be left, when written stuff wherever, you go away, people can come up when there's nobody else around, get the information, know what to do next, leave, more people can come. So it's like these spaces of sharing information either on the ground or technology. So 
<clears throat> I don't know. I feel like we just have to keep learning from one another and evolving. <clears throat> There's lots of things that we've done historically that still work, and we need to keep evolving. And right now, during COVID, we're evolving even more on online protests and on the ground protests that are safe. So, th- I, I mean, th- they were able to get corral three million protesters in a city of six million people. That is stunning. If we could be, I mean, if we could do that in the United States, we could actually take our government back because, you know, I mean, we don't live in a democracy. Our vote doesn't matter. And, you know, we live in what Dylan Radigan refers to as a rapacious oligarchy. That's exactly what we're living in right now. And we're headed towards Brazil. So it just seems like if they can get three million people in the streets in Hong Kong at a snap of a finger, if we could do something like that here, that's well, in fact, it it seems like that's all going to be the only thing that actually saves this country. I don't think people realize how bad things actually are and what their government is actually doing to them at this moment right now. They do not realize what is actually happening and that what this country is going to look like when we come out of this pandemic. It's going to be a radically different country and they don't realize there's going to be permanent large numbers of unemployment there's going to be a permanent underclass there's going to be scaling back of state services because the states are bankrupt and they can now they can't raise taxes because people don't have any money it is a spiral that is coming and 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 we're going to need to get people like you to get people in the streets so we can take back this country because right now they hate you your your leaders your government hates you and they are punishing you right now and you might you i know lots of people are already feeling it but if you're not you are going to feel it soon and you're right. going to look around this country and it's not going to it's not going to be the country you thought you had by the way they all they, they, they they're spying on us they're the fourth amendment is completely gone so now to organize like this is much harder they just had a vote yesterday to stop the fbi from being able to warrantlessly spy on your internet searches right and it failed by one vote bernie sanders did not show up for that vote he sold you out again so now uh, when we people like you or me or anybody wants to organize, the government can now spy on your activity just like it Occupy. They knew exactly who the people's a target was when they wanted to break that up because they were spying on them electronically and they're going to be doing it again. And people do not give a shit that this is happening. It's not covered in the media correctly. People don't know what's happening. Bernie Sanders doesn't say anything about it because he's part of it. Back to Hong Kong. One of the reasons the numbers got big is because when the police attacked the youth, the elders started to come out. And we've seen through any movement when the state represses, it happened in Ferguson, it happened in Standing Rock, more people rise up. And so again, we're in this very difficult moment, but you're absolutely right. And I think one of the big tests is gonna be when Trump calls off the election in November and tries to hold on to power. And so a number of us are talking about how do we prepare for that? So there's no question in my mind that we are, you know, that authoritarianism is spreading around the world. A lot of Trump is a main leader of that. And that we, we're much, we may not see capitalism collapse, but we're definitely going to see more repression. So we have to take this seriously. And one of the things I've been talking to people about is mutual aid networks have been forming and they're spreading all across the country and world. And how can those networks begin to see themselves as the network for community defense and protection and our networks of resistance for when that repression comes? Because we're building solidarity. We're meeting people's needs. We're learning how to organize in this space. We just have to vision beyond it to be like, how are we going to protect and defend our communities when this goes down? How do we keep meeting the needs? And um, and so I think there's some hope for building these networks of resistance. So you're saying that there's these spontaneous uh, 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 creations of these support networks. Where are they? How do I find them? Oh, man, they are. So so mutual aid is a concept that's been around for a long time, a lot in anarchist organizing. But it's all there's a website. One of the best list of them that I have found is on a website called It's Going Down. And it's under COVID resources. But these networks exist, like there's like three, four, five, six in almost every city. They're across Europe. Um, And it's a basic idea that we are here to help one another. And so it's people are delivering food. People are taking people to medical visits. 
People are helping with transportation. People are checking on the elderly. Some of it's neighborhood-based. Some of it's city-based. A lot of people are raising money. An outspurt of it was, um, what was it, redistribute the checks, urging people that were getting those stimulus checks that didn't need them to put them towards people that do. Um, in my community in Austin, Texas, we're part of this racial equity solidarity network that's adopted a bunch of families. We've raised over $50,000, making cash grants to families. We're delivering meals to you know a number of families every day throughout the week. So these things are happening all over the place. Wow. And but the funny thing is, is that the state is actually, we have like everything else that's effective, the state begins to try and figure out how to co-opt it. And so this term, which has been more radical grassroots movements, is now becoming mainstream. And we have to make sure that we don't lose the power because these networks have always come into being as a response to when the state fails. And so, you know, a lot of people are coming in that are not radical or that political, and that's a good thing, but they are, we have to just be careful for co-optation. And we have to realize that these are forms of a political act to meet the needs of the people and build power and not to do, not to let the state off the hook Right. Because Trump would love it if we took care of all this stuff and the government didn't have to. They have an obligation. They need to be taking care of the people. They're not going to do it. So we're going to do it ourselves. But we're going to keep the pressure on um, to to win what is just for people. And that's that's what a lot of the big organizations are doing. There's a group called the People's Bailout. Right. That are fighting to get funny money redistribute. There's a campaign by some called the Essential Worker. So there's lots of mainstream groups that are fighting to get the government to do the right thing. But in the meantime, people on the grassroots level are taking care of one another. Boy, that's incredible. So it's going down.com. That's it. It's going down.com. It might be, might be .org. Okay. We'll yeah. definitely check that out. Did you get that stuff? I sure do. So. Uh, dot .org. Dot, it's a dot .org. Yep. And if you go to the COVID resources, you'll see there's a list of them all across the country. Okay. That's. Uh, so in a perfect world. Uh you know, say to, to, if if you woke up tomorrow and you had the power to be a super organizer in order to fight. See, let me just say this. So you talk about so Trump might call off the election and then we're, you're, you're already planning to organize against that to make sure we have an election. Now, here's my problem. Uh, his major opponent is a guy who, during this last crisis, kicked five point one million families out of their house at the behest of Wall Street. So, hooray, we got Joe Biden. Is what what is that? No, I mean, it's terrible. I mean, th this is why I, I don't believe that the current either party is going to solve our problems. That's why I've always worked in the streets and directly to get up alternatives. But that's why I liked that quote by Anna Arundhati Roy. You, we, are, we are voting for the enemy that we want to have. We have to be very clear. These people are not going to be saving us. They're not going to work on behalf of the people. They're beholden to the 1% the interests. But who can we most effectively go after? And um, I'd rather, you know, it's like I, I'd rather have Biden in there than Trump right at this point. So the problem with that, would you have rather had uh, Barack Obama or John McCain? I would have taken Barack Obama. Really? Do you think John McCain would have been that the left would have allowed John McCain to make the banks bigger, take us from two wars to seven, uh, kick 5.1 million families out of their house, release the National Fossil Fuels Exportation Act? We have five, Do you think he would have been allowed to do that and no pushback from the left? Because Barack Obama was and there was zero pushback from the left. And that's what happens when you vote for this guy who you think you can push around. That's bullshit. Uh, history shows it's not true. In fact, when you keep voting, Voting for the person you think you can push around, which is just another term for voting for lesser of two evil. You do that for a couple decades, you end up with Trump and fascism. So that's a right. horrible strategy. No, well, but but that is not my strategy. OK, that sounds like it. <laughs> because I agree with you. Okay. And that's one of the problems, as you know, it's like that. Yeah, I mean, if we and part of the problem is that labor unions and nonprofit organizations and community based organizations are beholden to the Democratic Party. Yes. And that's a, that's a problem. And like one of the things I keep saying to people, we're likely to get Trump again because one, incumbents typically win. The election process and system is flawed. It's corrupt. And Democrats are completely capable of losing on their own. And given those conditions, <laughs> we're going to get Trump again. And 
you know, then once you get in the debt, if you do get the Democrat, then all the folks are like, oh, we can't go after them. We can't organize because we don't want to give the right wing. It's like, no, we have to organize even harder against them. And so this network that we're talking about post-election, whether Trump or Biden gets in, we should be shutting stuff down the day after. We should be right because it's like that shutting things down, taking over the streets, preventing them from doing what they're doing is the only thing they understand short of like billions of dollars in their pockets. And so, so uh, yeah, so, so that's my, my thing is keep organizing, keep the pressure on, create a social crisis, whether it's a Democrat or Republican, be clear of the vision of what you want and keep organizing it. There's two strategies, dismantling, shutting it down while simultaneously building what we want. We got to do both at the same time. So the day after, say it's the day after the election, what would you what would you target to shut down? What social crisis would you try to create? Well, I mean, there's two two lines of thought. And again, I've been on my book tour before this all happened. I was urging people to come to D.C. to swarm the White House and shut down Washington, D.C. So that's really going after the political players in the realm of Extinction Rebellion. Um, <clears throat> we know that creating an economic cost is what is they understand. And so you can also look at uh, key tra- infrastructure, key transportation infrastructure uh, is, a, is a major place, whether it's the ports, the highways, the shipping, right? The So like you can look at what happened in Canada around the pipeline. People were shutting down the trains all across the country. So we have to look at disrupting economic infrastructure. And, and okay, you want to, okay. Well, listen, that's... Uh, I hope everybody checks out your book, and I really appreciate your time today. So here's the book, uh, Shut It Down by Lisa Fithian. Uh, you've got lots of great success stories about how to organize and, all the, and lots of victories, and you even point to Nicaragua. Uh, tell, do you mind telling people quickly how you, you, you feel that you organized uh, successfully against the, what was happening in Nicaragua? Well, um And then I want to go back to that other thing because I want to add something to it. But it was in the 1980s um, when the U.S. CIA was waging a war against the people of Nicaragua because they overthrew the U.S.-backed dictator. They began a covert war. And so it started at people of faith around this country took a pledge that said we would be willing to risk arrest, engage in civil disobedience to prevent a U.S. invasion of Nicaragua. And that started in the early 80s. And for years and years and years, it spread all across the country, in cities all across the country, kind of like Occupy spread very quickly. And people were willing and began to engage in civil disobedience, shutting down federal buildings, shutting down military installations, shutting down recruiting centers, doing days of coordinated action. And we uh, we expanded to El Salvador and Nicaragua. And so basically what happened is that the U.S. never invaded Nicaragua. They did a counterinsurgency war, but... At the end of the day, they were not able to do what they wanted to do and get rid of the Sandinistas. The Sandinistas got got themselves out on their own problems, um, and to, to this day continues to create some problems. But you know, as a as a movement willing to engage in nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience, we we fully believe we thwarted an invasion of Nicaragua. So um, that that's interesting to me because I was in college and I had a poli sci one hundred and five professor who informed us what was happening and I couldn't believe it. I would I would turn on the news. And I'm like, that's not what they're saying. I would open up the newspaper. I'm like, that's not what they're saying is happening. And then, of course, that's exactly what was happening. And that's what it's a story that's been repeated over and over and over. U.S. imperialism. We overthrow democratically elected governments, install a puppet, and we steal their resources. So right. that was a big awakening for me, and that's why I was interested to hear your yeah. story about. Uh, your success story uh, c- connected to that, which is fantastic. And then, Jimmy, just the other thing I want to add, because I know, like, that talking about actions around uh, infrastructure is pretty dicey, and a lot of people might scare people. But I think the other thing that we really need to focus on is is the money and the banks and the these big financial institutions that are making all this stuff possible. That's happening a lot around the climate movement, and we need to keep our eyes on the money. So I had uh, I, I had someone on uh, a, a, a union leader on early in the crisis and and uh, it was right after the first stimulus had passed and it was obvious that our government was going to screw us and that they weren't going to meet our needs. 
and the work or the essential workers needs weren't being met there any and so i had a utility on i said what i go wouldn't it be smart right now for you know uh, to have a, a shutdown a work stoppage right now of essential workers so we could demand all this stuff and that person said, I don't think that would be a good thing to do in the middle of a pandemic. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, maybe you should wait till you have zero leverage. I mean, uh, what what do you say to that? Well, <clears throat> I say that, um, you know, well, a couple of things I say is one is like you're continuing. Well, I ask people, what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Labor unions have been doing the same thing over and over again, and they keep losing, 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 right? Yeah. And I let them know I disagree. You know, I've been involved in many union struggles, and I've spoken my mind to a number of labor leaders at times because <clears throat> I watch them lose. And so I always push them. And I think part of it is like, you know, in the book, I talk a lot about these weeks of rage. And you know, I think there's ways to organize and create social disruptions within the labor movement that doesn't put them completely at risk and that's more within their comfort zone. But it's organizing in a whole different way and a whole different scale. And so I think we just have to keep pushing. And, and you know, I mean, I wish I knew the answer. I wish we could just like do this and they would learn from history about where their real power is and look at their reality that they're dealing with of losing power and so I don't know. And and then just, you know, I always feel like if we can't move, then you've got to out-organize. And so how do we support all these wildcat strikes and all the workers that are taking action and really make that as successful as possible? Because that's going to help create momentum and hopefully change the conditions where these other labor leaders will realize that's the better way to go. How do we support these? Well, how, how do someone like me, I mean, other than bring attention to it, that's what I try to do. How do people support wildcat strikes? Is, are you talking about, you talked about those networks of support. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. And, or, you know, and, and you mentioned it earlier, the payday report has got a strike tracker. You know, if there's a strike going on in your community, you know, you might make a phone call or reach out, even if it's not in your community, you could reach out to the, the workers, they often have Facebook pages, whatever. You could make a financial donation. If they're in your community, organize a food drive and come and drop the bags of food off so they get food if they're going out on strike. Um, make phone calls to the, to the corporations or the company that they're doing. If they've got a petition or start a petition on their behalf, if it's a grocery store, do it as I'm a shopper in the thing. Do a petition of the shoppers and say, we support these workers. Do the right thing. Send it to the corporation. So, um, you know, so it's always best to reach out and find out what they want and what they need um, and then offer to help do work and organize and raise money. It's always about, you know, material resources in this period is key to support these workers. Lisa Fithian, author of Shut It Down and a great organizer. Uh, thanks for spending time. Thanks for lending your expertise to us. You're always welcome back on the show if there's anything you want to uh, help at, uh, you know, publicize. We're certainly here to help. Thanks so much, Jimmy. I appreciate your time and, and focusing on this. We really need voices like yours helping to form men and get people to understand the importance of organizing and supporting workers right now. So thank you. Okay. No, thank you. You're doing the real work. Hey, this is the part where I tell you where our live shows are, but there aren't any. <laughs> and then I would tell you to go join our premium, but, but nobody has a fucking job. So why don't you just enjoy the video?